Very cool. Yep. Nice. Okay, so by now you're very familiar with Evgeny, uh, but I'm Ayrton, and if you remember me from the last Tech Days, we had a session about Power Platform, Power Automate, and the improvements that we had made there regarding uh, bringing instant flows to Business Central. So we have continued invested in this area, and today we're going to talk some more about that. So we're going to talk about the improvements that we've made to approval workflows. We're going to talk about some quality of life changes that we've made in the Power Automate connector on the Power Automate side, and within Business Central Client as well. We've introduced external business events, which are going to allow you to notify your external systems about things that happen in Business Central. And finally, we've introduced some new Power Automate actions that let you integrate with these events and uh, use some functionality within Teams. So I'm going to hand it over to Evgeny first, who's going to talk about the new approval workflows. Yeah, so the first question we always get asked, like a year ago, one half year ago, can I approve something on the phone? Can I get my invoice approval? Uh, Forever. Can you do it on the phone? And community said, yeah, maybe, yes, we don't know. And the truth is, you could back in the day, you can do now, and hopefully we don't get this conversation uh, going forward. So it's like, yes, you can, and yes, you should. Uh, this is how world looked six months ago. So we gave you capability to create workflows and approvals, but it's a little bit like a messy. Or maybe not that it was like a functional, but not desirable. You had to create very complicated flows. You had to pass like a, some content, like monkey copy environment and company through all the blocks. It was functional, but maybe not that usable, so to speak, or enjoyable. So this release, we hope we did a better job to give you a number of templates, something you can discover, click, configure, and basically it just work out of the box. So next time, I have a discussion, can I approve on a phone for the, you know, your clients? The answer is yes, you can, let me show you, and just basically get it done uh, with no time. Let's see it's an action. So with that, we're going to move to, we'll change. We're gonna role -to play a bit. So I wanna show you how you can configure a purchase order approvals. So I go to purchase orders, like anyone really, then you need to find uh, actions, approval, request approvals, power automate, and then you have like a create power automate approval flow. It's a bit of hidden. You'll do a better job to promote it, but that's where it is. And you can do it for all, obviously, document types, not necessarily for disorders. Now, when I run this UI, it gives me this like a just pleasure to my eyes place to start to select my templates. If you do work with Microsoft Teams, for example, create automation, it's exactly the same. Uh, usability, and I have here multiple templates, not one. Well, three is better than zero, and we're going to build you more and more as you go. I can say, I want to have a template. If someone requests for approval for just purchase order, I can be notified, and maybe I need one response, one appro approver, maybe multiple people have to be part of the process, uh, and so on and so forth. So I just created the first one because it's the easiest to demo and the easiest to show. That workflow process involves a couple of components, Business Central, obviously, Microsoft team approval apps, obviously, and some, some notification that things can happen. It's a template, meaning we give you initial structure, you can go ahead and modify it yourself, or actually your customers, even without calling you. You need to define or select a bit, like which company you're talking about, where are you, and then who needs to be part of that approval process. Arton, who needs to be part of the approval process? Uh, you do. Yes, good. you are the approver. Yeah, makes yeah. sense. I'm kind of a manager and saying, every time someone asks for approval, I want to be in charge, I guess. Like, doesn't work in the real life, but we can, we can, <laughs> we can take it for, for example. So, then, so now we have approval running, and I can continue to do my job and just maybe forgot about that step. And now we're going back to Arthur. Yeah, so it's very fortunate that Evgeny has created an approval workflow because I have created a purchase order that I need him to sign off on. So I'm just gonna send him an approval request. And I can see that the status of the purchase order has changed to pending approval. And now on Evgeny's side, hopefully he's received an approval request. Yeah, I got notified. Actually, I can get notified on my phone on a go. I'll review it, say yes. But for uh, scientific purposes, we are in the web. I get an approval. I can get a lot of custom information. You can configure all that. Who is involved? Why is happening? What is the business reason? I can look on attachment on the documents and so on and so forth. And at some point of time, I can say, 
yes, okay. And I'll always use opportunity to remind you that we're in the modern days and you press approval button. So basically I approved, continue with my day and now we go back to Artun. Yes, so now that Evgeny has approved my purchase order, I should receive an email saying that the purchase order was approved. There you go. So if you've used the workflow approvals before, then maybe you've received this email and it just says, you know, your approval was uh, approved, congrats, right? But we've made some improvements here too. So now that we're able to support both single and multi-approver flows, uh, flows where you require everybody to approve who's listed in the, the, the approvers list, we show you a table of everybody who signed off and the comments that they left and what their response was. So if you need to follow up with someone who uh, rejected your request, then you know exactly who they are and you can go and facilitate that conversation. And we also provide you a link to this record. So if you were in the middle of working on it and you switched context, now you can quickly get back to this record without having to look it up yourself. We give you the URL to the web client and if I click this, it's gonna take me straight back to this document. It doesn't remove capabilities to get your standard approval process in Business Central. Yes, you go to UI, find a button, approve, reject. But if you use Teams, which many of your customers use, we know that, and we are, you can give them just better tools to do the same job. Now we can go back to presentation. Yeah, uh, quick, quickly summary. We give you different templates. Template means you click it, you configure it runs, but you can go ahead and customize, and you have a choice for different situations. You can always go ahead to more advanced mode and do more stuff if you will, or if you wish. We don't recommend, but you can. Uh, we took an opportunity to look on all the approval templates we had and make it better. We also add like a push this quote document. So now out of the box, you can configure approvals for all this in a couple of clicks. So we hope we don't have this conversation anymore. Can I approve? Because the answer is yes, you can, absolutely. And actually, we also show you how you can make it for custom entities, just in a second, not only what Microsoft give you uh, out of box. More, Power Automate in Business Central. I, I showed in a keynote uh, briefly, and I'll do it again very quickly because it'll help us to demonstrate point in the future. The same idea of, a, or maybe I should say the same concept of giving you templates to start build automations can also apply for what we call internally custom actions. So every time I want to build flow for that entity, I should be able to start not with the emptiness, which is kind of lovely but not that helpful, but start with a number of templates. So something I can choose, yeah, and go from it. In this case, you have one template. One is better than zero. Again, we'll get you more. And this template, it's very simple template, how you can basically have a flow which will uh, allow you to block your customer, yeah, externally. Yeah. Uh, you need to define who can be responsible for that. I'll just say, again, Evgeny. Again, very easy to create automations in a product without leaving the product. Power Platform has 1,000 connectors, one more time, 1,000. So you can really build impressive stuff beyond like the primitive demos uh, we are showing you right now. However, the question arrives is always, where would those flows be safe and stored? It's like a question number one. Yes, you create a flow, but how do we manage it? Where it's stored? What does it mean? And so on and so forth. Uh, in this release, we give you an ability to select, configure, and define where your flows will be stored. We're also giving you a powerful dev tools to build your Power Platform solution with IL code. We'll show you it tomorrow. We'll show you briefly in the keynote. But for now, just you can always define and configure where your flows will be stored. And we'll, sh we'll have like a short demo about it. Yep. So now we're going to demonstrate more, more Power Automate in Business Central. So if I switch to my laptop, then uh, as Evgeny says, you can now configure which uh, Power Platform environment your Business Central environment connects to. And if I look back to the last tech days, I remember that the probably most popular, even only question that I was asked was, how do I actually use this in my setup where I have multiple power platform environments, maybe for different departments in the company, or just because we don't want to use the default one. So if you see on the screen right now, I'm not in the Contoso default environment. I'm in my own custom environment that I set up for this demo. And I have an instant flow that is called, I'm in the BC Tech Days 2023 environment. So if I switch back to Business Central, and I open up the automate menu, then I can see this flow, even though it belongs to a non-default environment. So maybe you're wondering, how did I configure this? So if we go to the assisted setup list, 
and find the uh, Power Automate Environment Wizard, then, I mean, I've already set this up because you can see these flaws in my environment, but if I just step through all of the instructions, then I can see a list of all of the Power Platform environments that are available to me. And now I have the option to choose which environment I'm connected to, but I can also choose on behalf of the organization because I'm a system administrator. So if you have a single environment that needs to be the default for everyone, you can apply that first, and then you can choose on individual user basis if you need some special setup for, for particular users. Um, so you know, like I hope that this satisfies, satisfies uh, everybody with that kind of setup and that this is a, a big quality of life improvement for you. We've also made some improvements on the Power Automate connector itself. So if you've set up an approval workflow before, then you may remember this screen because usually when you click the template, it takes you to the flowchart instead. Uh, and what would happen is that you would open this up and in every single trigger and action, you would need to enter the environment and company that this should run against. And if you pick the wrong one, then your flow doesn't work, right? Well, so now what we've done is we've taken the environment and company that is configured in the trigger, and we output that at every stage from every action and trigger in the connector. You can now see which environment and company that's supposed to be from and configure it to use the same one. There's only one caveat to this, which is uh, in order to see the IntelliSense, you do need to actually pick an environment first. As, so, as of now. As of now. We're looking into a way to work around this. But at the moment, if I want to see the IntelliSense, then I need to pick the um, environment and company. And then when I look in here, I can see all the API endpoints that are available to me. Because we need to know what extensions you've got installed in order to surface this information. Right? But once you've built your flow, you can then go back and replace these values with the uh, environment and company dynamic values. And then your flows become portable between environments. So if you are a partner who is trying to deliver Power Automate solutions to your customers, and you're finding that you're having to configure these values in all the flows, or you just can't ship business central flows because you need to go to the customer's environment and change these values. Now you can build them in a generic portable way um, in order to build this. And I think that is that. Yeah, great. So the next thing that I want to talk about is new custom action types that we've introduced. So looking back to the um, request approval example that we did before. You want to, you want to change? Yeah, I'm going to change back to my... Um, just quickly, yeah. So going back to the example before, Evgeny, you said uh, this action could be more prominent in the page. And it can be because this is a custom action and yeah. it can be personalized with the designer and moved somewhere else, right? So if I wanted to take this action and drag and drop it into this group, then I should be able to do that. Um, so the type of this action is a um, template gallery action. So what we will do is open up the template UI and show the templates in a particular category. So I mean, you can see the template UI is opened up, so I'll just switch back to my slides. Um, yeah, so there's two different types of action. And one action is this flow template, which opens up a specific template directly to the editor. So if you have a template that you know you want to invoke, you can just go straight there. Otherwise, if you have a, a group of templates, for example, you want people to work with approvals or notifications, things like that, then you can specify a category instead and allow users to choose for themselves. Um, so how do you write these custom actions? So if I switch over to VS Code, then all I need to do is add a custom action the way that you regularly would. Uh, I need to define the custom action type, and I have these uh, the flow, which is run an instant flow, or flow template, which is uh, open up a template in the template UI. So now I have two options for how to configure this. So I can pass the flow caption, which is the uh, caption that will be used by default when you open up the template editor. So I can just say, like, uh, my new flow, right? And then the next option that I need to configure is the template that should open. So I say flow template ID, and I can get this template ID from Power Automate. So for example, if I wanted to surface this create an item in SharePoint when a record is created in Business Central template, then I can go to this flow template ID and just enter the, the GUID there. Uh, and now when I publish this and I click this action, then this is going to open up the template UI directly to this template. And what if I want to use the template gallery instead? Well, I can just change it to flow template gallery. And now the flow template ID is obviously invalid because I'm not showing a specific template, I'm showing a category of templates. So instead I need to choose a category name. And there's all the basic ones like approval, notification, things like that. And they're available just in Power Automate by default. Or we also provided some custom categories which you can find on our own actions in Base App. So for example, we have like D365 BC approval item, and that shows you all the item approval templates, or purchase order, or general journal, et cetera. Or D365 BC 
instant will show you the instant flows that appear in the automate menu. This is the same one that we use. So I know that the next question that I will get is, uh, how do I create my own Power Automate templates? And unfortunately, uh, if you want your templates to appear in this template gallery, they need to be in the public Power Automate gallery, which means that you need to coordinate this with the Power Automate team, right? So unfortunately, we're a little bit limited at the moment. It's only if you have your own external integration that you plan to ship templates for, then you'll be able to surface those in Business Central, but you need to coordinate that with them, and they have documentation for this, which is available in the slides. As of now. As of now, we're investigating options for you to bring your own templates outside of the public gallery, but this is still a work in progress. We don't have an ETA on this, so just bear with us while we, we figure this out. Right. So that was it for Power Automate for now, and now we're going to switch topics a little bit to uh, external business events. So what is an external business event? Well, you can notify external systems when an event happens in Business Central. So, for example, our Power Automate connector is an external service which we want to notify when uh, an item is created, approval is requested, things like that. Right? That's the kind of systems that you can notify. You can discover and subscribe to these events via our OData APIs. Uh, you can get notified via HTTP post to a URL that you provide to us. And we provide some events that you can subscribe to out of the box as examples, but also just for functionality. Uh, and you can create your own events as well in your AL extensions using the external business event attribute. So these are the custom events that are available out of the box. I'm not going to go through all of them, but it's a lot related to purchases, sales, uh, quotes, and you know sales opportunities. So we expect to deliver more of these. We're going to roll them out as time goes on, but this feature is in preview, so we're still thinking of ways that we need to expose parts of business behavior for you to hook into. Uh, how do these differ from regular AL events? So, I mean, most of you are probably familiar with traditional AL events, like integration events, business events, and they are subscribed to using an AL procedure with this event subscriber attribute, and they're handled in AL. So you define the behavior of the event in AL, you call the event in AL, everything happens in the AL runtime. Um, but external business events are discovered and subscribed to via OData instead. You don't use an event subscriber. You implement the behavior in your own service and you're notified via webhooks, right? So you handle these on your side. So the way that this works is you define, sorry, this is extremely small, but you define the event in AL and then the external service can discover that the event is there. Business Central responds with the list of events that are available and then you can add a subscription to this event and Business Central will confirm that the subscription is created. So now your users start using the product and events occur in AL, and at some point after these events happen, we're gonna notify you via a post request that these events have occurred. So this is the, the overall process we're gonna step through now. So the way that you define an external business event is very similar to traditional business events. Uh, so they're defined in AL using this external business event attribute. You raise it by calling the procedure just as a regular event, and subscribers receive the parameters of the procedure as a payload in the post body that you receive. So for example, here is my business event. The name of this that I need to refer to it as is my business event. Uh, you provide a display name that will be used in, for example, Power Automate or your own services when you, you surface these, and a description of how this works. Right? It's not only for you, but also for users, if you would like to use it for that. And then you need to provide a category for filtering as well. So on the Power Automate side, we uh, you know, if we showed you every single event that was available, the list would go on for miles. So you need to provide filtering categories so that users can easily find your events, either through the API or through UI like Power Automate. And then finally, you just define your procedure. So I say my business event, and now I need to specify uh, data that I want to send to the external subscriber. So we don't allow you to pass a whole record. The intention of this is not for you to pass the entire sales invoice, right? You just need to pass enough information that the subscribers can request more and perform simple operations with that. So, I mean, here I just have some sample parameters with uh, primitive data types, and then there is no event body because this is handled externally. Right? So this is an example from BaseApp that is present today. Uh, we have the sales order released event that admits a sales order ID, the one that was posted, uh, and the URL of that in the API so that you can make a request for more data. And how do you raise this? Well, we already have the internal event subscriber for when a sales order is, is released. So you can just call the external business event. So now every time a sales order is released, then uh, webhook notifications will be sent out to all the subscribers of this event as well. Uh, how do you protect this data, right? So if you look at the previous slide, you can see that this is only exposing the sales order ID and URL, but you might want to expose things like the customer that is involved in this or the total sales value, things like that. So how do you make sure that internal subscribers can't see data that they don't have permissions to read. So 
external business events can expose this data and you should define permissions that are required to create the subscription. Right? These are permissions that apply to the subscriber when they create the subscription, not to the user who triggered the event. So for example, if Evgeny doesn't have permission to read certain tables and, and he triggers an event, it doesn't matter that he doesn't have the permission. The important part is that I have the permission to read this data right, as the subscriber. So um, if you need to define permissions, then all you need to do is add another attribute, required permissions, and then you just say you know, what object type and uh, additional parameters you need to provide. Here I'm saying the subscriber needs to be able to read the sales header table. And you can define as many required permissions as you like, just line after line after line. And you know, the subscriber must have all of these permissions in order to subscribe to this event. So now how do you discover events? We've created our events, we've published our extension. How do I actually find these and start creating these subscriptions and get notified? So the events are exposed via OData API. Uh, every OData API has the extension, uh, endpoint external business event definitions. And if you make a get request to this, then we'll just give you back all of the events. Right? But it's an OData API, so you can apply filters so that you can narrow this down to the events that you're looking for. So for example, here is one event that was returned. This is. Uh, Again, the sales order released event, and we give you the name and the description, but we also tell you what kind of data you can expect to receive when you uh, receive a notification of this event. So this comes in a serialized JSON format, but I deserialized it for you. Uh, and you can see here that it tells you the order that these parameters will appear in and also the data types that you can expect to receive. And even though this is an OData API, the notifications come via webhook. So these are nav data types, which means that you need to be able to handle those on your own external system. You need to be able to interpret these and, and figure out what type you should expect to receive in, in whatever language or service is implemented in. Um, so how do I subscribe to events? Well, very similar. The subscriptions are also managed via OData API. All the OData APIs have the endpoint external event subscriptions. You can subscribe via post to any of the APIs. And this is what that request looks like, right? So my subscription type is webhook. I think this is optional. But then I need to say which uh, AL extension via app ID and event name do I want to subscribe to, right? So here, this is the sales order release from base app. Which company do I want to subscribe to this in? This is optional. You don't need to define it. You can alternatively give the company name, but you can subscribe to events on an environment-wide basis. Right? You don't need to filter by company if you don't want to. This is just uh, for your own purposes. Then you need to provide the URL of your service that we should send the post notification to. So here I've just said, uh, I have a single endpoint that I would like you to notify me at, and it is this. Um, and then you can pr additionally provide some more information. So here we have this client state. So this is any data that you want to be returned to you when this notification is fired to, for example, indicate what type of uh, subscription or what the purpose of this subscription is, what action it should invoke on your service. So in our Power Automate Connector, we do exactly the same to so subscribe to this. And in the client state, we place the uh, like ID of the flow that should run when this event is fired. Right? Um, so to get notified, Business Central is going to send a post to the notification URL that you provided, and you will receive a list of events that occurred since the last time you were notified. So events can be bundled up. Uh, like if there's a, a long transaction that has many operations to trigger many events, then you'll receive a list of events. Um, and the payload for each event includes the client state from the subscription that it came from. So they're bundled by notification URL, not by subscription, not by event. So I might receive many events from many different subscriptions all in the same uh, notification. So if you provide the same endpoint all the time, then your main routing endpoint needs to uh, be able to handle these different events. Or you can provide a different notification endpoint for every subscriber, it's up to you. Uh, so this is what this looks like. And you know, I'm going to get the, uh, the identifier of the event that was fired, the time that it occurred, the AAD user ID of the user who triggered it. So then you can do a lookup in graph to find out more information about them and correlate that with the Business Central user. Uh, the company name, we always provide this even if you didn't specify a filter. We will always give you the company that this occurred in. And then the information that came from the business event, the sales order ID and URL in this case, and the client state that you receive. Right. So now I'm just going to do a quick demo of how this works. Um, yeah, ex exactly. Uh, right. So I need to first, in my extension, add some business events. So the scenario here is that Consorcio Electronics has decided to go into the production of widgets. And I need a approval process for this because this is a custom data type. We don't provide any templates out of the box. Um, so I need to provide some business events that enable to me respond to this action, this send approval request. So I'm going to go into my extension and create a new business event. So all I need to do here is exactly as we saw in the slides, um, create a new business event, and we'll just call it a widget approval requested. And now the event name is the same. 
uh, widget approval requested. And in the interest of time, I'm just going to put a yeah, name description, right? And the category. So in order to define a category, you need to extend the uh, event category enum with your own category there. You can add as many as you like. And now I can surface my event in this particular category. So this is widgets. And finally, I need to define some parameters. So I would like the uh, subscriber to receive not only the ID of the record, but I would also like them to receive, uh, for example, the name, the display name of the widget. So we'll say uh, I have a name, and I also have a description, um, which is some more text. So now, in this event that I have created, I am exposing some data about this widget, right? I'm giving the name and the description. So I want to make sure that anyone who subscribes to this can't read this data unless they have the permission. So all I need to do now is add a required permission to the uh, widgets table, and the permission level is read, right? And now anyone who subscribes will be rejected unless they have this permission. Um, so finally, I need to actually trigger this, so I have the send approval request action, and all I need to do here is um, just call my function, right? Widget approval requested, and it's with the system ID, yeah. Give it the system ID and also give it the name and the description. So I'm not gonna publish this now because I actually published this to my production environment using ALGO for GitHub. So we're just gonna skip straight to uh, using the webhooks and subscribing, using the business event, sorry. So if I go to the API v2, external business event definitions and send this request, then I will get back a list of other credentials. I'm not right, let me just sign in. So if I send a request to this API, then I'll receive a list of every business event that is in the product, right? So you can see even though um, like I've just added this single event, I'm actually getting all the events like customer blocked, uh, customer unblocked, sales invoice released, et cetera. So now if I go to my own API, this is the API that I provided to work with these widgets, and I send the same request, then I'm gonna receive exactly the same response. I can still see like customer blocked, um, customer unblocked. So we've just mirrored the API between all the endpoints so that you don't need to manage several endpoints. But if you want to limit this to events that are relevant to you, then you can use the OData filters, right? So for example, here I applied the filter contains the name widget. So if I send this, now I'm only gonna see events that have the name widget, for example, this widget approval requested that we just added. And now I can subscribe to this. So I need to subscribe to the event. I've already populated my, uh, my app ID. And the event I'd like to subscribe to is a widget approval requested. Um, the notification URL is acting as my service. I'm going to use this application webhook.site where I can easily test the webhook notifications. So I want to notify this URL. And when I send an approval, I should see the output appear here. So I'm going to pass this URL. Uh, and the client state, I'm just going to say hi from BC Tech Days. You can put anything that you like here, up to 2048 characters. Uh, so if I send this, then I get the response back 201 created. So now my subscription is there. And if we look here, I haven't received any events yet. So what I'm going to do is send an approval request for this widget now using my action. And what I should find in a second is that my uh, subscriber was notified. You can see the client state there, hyphen BC Tech Days. Here is the widget ID. And now I can do more operations in the API to request more information about this and take some action on it. So uh, going back to this. Just a reminder that this is in preview. Uh, external business events are still being developed by us, and many aspects of this are subject to change. So please try them out and give us your feedback, but our expected GA for this is uh, 2024 wave one, so there's still a lot of work to be done, a lot of improvements to be made. You can join the discussions on Yammer about this if you would like to uh, join the conversation, and you can learn more about how to use business events, even though they're in preview, at our documentation. Um, and finally, we're going to talk about some of the new actions and triggers that we've introduced to Power Automate. I'll hand it off to Kenny. Yeah, so Artem showed you that we built technology. You can integrate with that through any kind of custom development code, through OData, very standard. In a secure way, you can expose your payloads, all good. If you don't want to pay attention to all this complexity, maybe you don't want to, you can use Power Automate to basically say in a very simple way, as I show you, hey, if business event priced, please act, which is obviously more, I guess, like enjoyable story for a, like a no-code developer like me. So it's really easy to 
uh, go ahead and build those flows. You can probably uh, skip this even demo for now. It's super, super important that you can define the payload. So you can say, if my order is delayed, you can send dates whom to notify order number, and you'll be able to discover that information and act with that very naturally, which is cool, cool stuff. Have we talked? a lot about how do you notify. I mean, every automation you do need to notify, you know, something has been approved, something has been delayed, just for your information, and it usually need to have a call for action, like you receive your notification, like how do you act with that? Uh, we give you more tools for this release, which allow you to notify users where to go, what to do. We have more, let's say, like a Lego blocks, which allow you to retrieve URLs for entity, create adaptive card, something you can post to your team channel so people can basically act and know what's going on. Why it's important? Because we can expose much more users to business centrals, to organizations. Again, our telemetry telling us almost all your customers, most of your customers are Microsoft clients. Out of 100 people organization, three has VC license, 97 don't even know that Cine exists, never heard about it, kind of not my stuff. And and people need to collaborate in the real world, you know, different offices, different locations. They use teams for collaboration. Like, I put my guys on a project from different locations over the world, the same you do to resolve your customers' issues. So now, with the teams, you can create a channel, like, like you can get your old people talk about delayed orders, as an everyone can part of conversation, and we don't have those artificial barriers, what to do. So the easiest way to demonstrate that, um, if we project to yep. the PC, so I have created an approval flow for this widget type, right? It's time oh. for us to implement the approval flow um, now that I've set up all of my events that I can subscribe to. So I've used the new when a business event occurs trigger, and I've said in the production environment, I want to subscribe to the event from my extension. This approval is requested for a widget, and the company is in Cronus, but this is just optional for us. And now I need to actually send the approval. So I get some information about this. I post some choice of options to the approver, which in this case is going to be Evgeny. And if Evgeny signs off, then first off, I'm just going to call my API to set the approval state. And now I'm going to use the uh, get URL and get adaptive card actions to send an adaptive card to notify the production team that this uh, widget has been approved. So to get the URL, I can just use the environment and company dynamic content from before. I didn't need to specify all of this again. Um, and then say, I want a link to the web client to this page using this widget ID. And then I would like to generate an adaptive card for this. And all I need to do is take the web client URL that I just generated and pass it to this action and say, I would like you to format this for Teams, please. And finally, I would like to post a message in our production announcements channel, say congratulations, it's been approved for production, and reply to that message with the adaptive card. So this is so, like a flow yeah. for a custom approval for a custom entity, and then you want to notify people through Teams or through Outlook, and then obviously I can go ahead and take an action and yeah. do that. So let's do it. Right? So I'm going to send an approval request for this. We can see that the state has changed on my end to open approval. And now if I switch to Evgeny, then you should receive a message. You should receive a message. I do receive a message. In the chat. In the chat. Yeah. <laughs> so there is different ways how you get notified. Right now we use like a bot, so basically something talking to me. And that's why I get like a pop-up. But there is different ways how you can arrange approvals. It can be part of a chart conversation. You can have people can look somewhere time to time and then basically reply by time allows. A lot of combinations. Same idea. I expose two buttons and I can say, approved. Looks good. And we are ready to roll. Yep. So now that Evgeny has approved this, hopefully my adaptive card is going to be sent to Teams. So in this scenario now, I am Sam who works for our organization, but he doesn't have a license for Business Central. So he works in our production department, and he needs to know that he needs to start working on this. So as Sam, I can see that the Beaver has been approved for production, and I can click Details on this adaptive card. And when I click this, it's going to open up uh, Business Central in read-only mode on this record, uh, because I have an M365 license. Right? So, so here you can see I can't take any action, but I can still see information about this. So we just enable Sam to get data from Business Central, he can open it, maybe Control C, Control V, some key fields, and get going. And back in the day, he'll probably call me. I look on Excel, send some data. Super unofficial, and it's just great. Yeah. Yep. So uh, that was that. So I, I guess that wraps up everything that we have to demo today. And I guess we've got a little bit of time to take some questions, and then I have a, a little summary to do. So.
Yeah, Let's we'll go. see hands. If anybody has any questions, then we'll, we'll throw you the uh, box. We have some t-shirts to hand out for anybody who does ask us a question. So uh, looks like somebody wants one. All right, hang on, there you go. So for the team user that needs the card, does the user need to have a user defined in Business Central to have so his the user is defined set? for you automatically. So sorry, the, the question, I don't know how loud this microphone is. So the question was, does Sam need to already exist as a user? Do I need to set him up as a user in order to see this data? And the answer is no. If you have an M365 license and you try to open one of these adaptive cards, then the user is created for you automatically. And the permissions are for all the Business Central objects that you send to the user. I, I can I can take it. Yeah. So uh, your question was, how do you configure setup so external people who has no clue to Business Central somehow get access to the data, which is unheard of? Obviously, we don't do it just because you can. I'll take two minutes if you share my screen for a second how you could uh, how it's basically configured. Let's see if have an environment. Yeah. So. You have, first of all, it's a, you, as an admin, you need to enable those capabilities. So if you go to admin center, admin center, to our, you have like a enable access with Microsoft 365, and by default you'll get no, because we don't want to expose business data outside of organization, it'd be like a horrible situation to be, we don't want that. So you're in control to enable that, to say yes, I would like to do it. After that, you can also define security group, like control which people, like your organization, your employees, maybe even your external vendors should be able to be part of that. Then we're giving you to the product where you define which permission set should be associated with this like newcomer. We recommend D65 read, meaning they can read, cannot act, but you can define yourself. And finally, there is so much documentation written on that, how to do it in a secure way. Uh, so basically you go ahead and read and you enable it in production. So we have a level, so we have a, a number of administrative steps to enable this feature. It's very controlled process. Uh, we don't expose any data. Yeah, just, just thought never came to us, by the way, in the first place. So it's a, we recommend you go enable it to your customers in a controlled way, show them how it works, build trust with that, and go to adopt. Because what's happening, now you can have a read-only view, you can say, hey, why does he or she can, I cannot. Suddenly you just get an ISO license, and an ISO license, and an ISO license, and that just, uh, that's how it grows. Good. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think we have time for one more, maybe. Yeah, great. Okay. Well, then let me just wrap up and chill for some more Microsoft talks. So, obviously, if you have any questions for us, maybe you don't want to ask us right now, but if you have any questions about our platform, there is a question. Then, oh, there's a question. Okay. Let's take it. Where are we going? I can't yeah. see because the light. Yeah, sorry, we have okay, a light. Yeah, a bit. There you go. It's just yeah. you're in the spot, invisible <laughs> spot for us. Yeah. So my question is how the authentication works for the external business events. So what what kind of permissions the the other the software on the other side needs to be able to subscribe for the external business events? It's all data. Yeah. Yeah. So at least in this case, the way that I set this up. Let me just switch back to my um, to me. So the way that I've set this up is I have an Azure AD application that uh, I, I set up in my environment that I have like given authorization credentials to, right? So I set that up as an application in Business Central, and then I use the client ID and secret to exchange for a token, and that's how I'm communicating with the OData API. And the Azure AD application, I think I can show that in Business Central. Um, so if I go to, yeah, Azure AD applications, and the Tech Days 2023 is the one that I created. And when you set this up, you need to provide your client ID and secret. And then you also need to apply some permissions to this, right? So I just gave myself everything because it's just for the demo, but you can choose which permissions you want to, um, to, to set. And then that application is only gonna be able to subscribe to events that it has permissions for. So this comes back to the required permissions from before. Uh, if I only had permission, like, like let's say I didn't have permission for this table, let's say I didn't have the super permissions. I didn't have permission for this, then my subscription will be rejected. So it's just not possible for me to subscribe to this. And I think we check it on the way out as well. So if your permissions change, then we're not going to notify you, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. Cool. Uh, external business events are in a preview, preview as of now, which is awesome. Uh, probably on the path to GA soon, maybe fall, we'll see. So give us a feedback if you see we need to improve something, like yeah. settings, configuration. Um, we hope it just works for you great. We do. We have like, let's take two more questions if you have. Um, oh, there's one up there. Yeah. Uh, sorry, well, I'm going to run up with the box. Good luck.
like I said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Too much kind of detail. All right. Where was I going? Over there. All right, hang on. Let's do it first. All right. Nice. All right. With the Power Automate, um, is there a way of passing through, like, instead of creating a flow for a specific email address, can you pass in parameters to the Power Automate? Because if you've got a big company and they've got hundreds of people, you'd want to pass in the email as opposed to setting up different flows. And the second part of the question is, can you also pass in, like, attachments? So if it's a purchase invoice coming in, someone might want to see the attachment as well yeah. from the customer. So, as, yeah, two questions. The first is, like, how can you pass the parameters? And the second is, can you pass attachments as well? So when you create an automated flow, then that's not triggered by the user. It's triggered automatically when an event occurs, right? It's not necessarily like a direct one-to-one, -one, you click this button, this happens. So with those, it's not possible for you to pass parameters. But it is possible to pass parameters to an instant flow. So let's say that instead of using these approval triggers, you said, for a selected record for this purchase invoice, then you start your approval flow. In that case, you can define parameters in the trigger that when the Power Automate panel opens, you invoke your instant flow, the panel opens, and then you're presented with parameters that we've asked you for, but also parameters that you defined yourself, right? And in that case, you can have an email field that is then referred to later, right? Yeah, and I mean, if you, like, we're gonna be down at the Expo booth immediately after this, so if you want, you can come down and I'll show you exactly how to do that, right? Um, and then the second question was attachments. So there's two ways to do this. I think there is like a file input in the, the you have an option of like text, email, um, file input, and some other types of parameters. And I think you can use those data types to put in there. But if you have like, a, like a zip file or something needs to go in, then we have an action in Power Automate that is get a document attachment. So if you have, for example, a document or a, a anything like a customer with a picture attached, something like that, you can retrieve attachments using this, um, attachments action. And you know, like if the attachment is uh, on this record in Business Central, then you can retrieve that attachment and then do things with it in the Power Automate flow. So there are ways to set that up, but it's just something we didn't demonstrate today. Yeah, yeah. so just so you can get access to all documents, basically saying from BC, give me my uh, PDF of an invoice, then you can send it to some scanning solution, get results back, some stuff like that. So we give you access to get documents, images, attachments, we even built a new endpoints with the previous release to allow you that. So also, yes, you can. That's how I build this Power App. We show them images and then bring those photos back just by using those APIs. So absolutely. Yeah. It's not something um, you couldn't do six months ago or 12 months ago. Something absolutely you can do right now. And it doesn't require any magic. It's just, it just out of the box. How are we doing for time? We have like one minute, 30 seconds, 29. Can you take one more? Or? Yeah, I'll take one more question and then we'll just go for, sorry, a, yeah. for lunch oh, together. Right. Yeah, and a follow-up to the last question. Can you use the approval flow of Business Central in your Power Automate approvals? The Power Automate like, approval work, well, so the, I mean, today, if you use these um, templates, then it's going to create an approval workflow in Business Central, right? And your approval uh, flow in Power Automate is linked to a Business Central workflow. Um, but then, I mean, if you create your own custom flow, then it's all on you, right? Then you need to you can create an approval in the approvals app, but then you need to set up your own API to set the state and things like that. We're looking into approvals for custom data types as well with the, the built-in triggers. But then again, this is another thing that we're working on in the, in the future. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.